Hello, and welcome to the very first episode of Void Talk. Uh, I'm your host, Rainstorm. You can call me Rain. Um, but, uh, so, so I guess I should quickly answer what the hell I'm doing. Um, I, I guess I'll just jump in. Uh, I am depressed. I have been depressed for seven years. So, and I'm in a bit of a slump. Job search is not going well. Um, and I wanted to do something. So basically what I do for most of my day is I sit online on, and I scroll through the news, YouTube, social media, and I see stuff, uh, not just about politics, but a lot of it is about politics. Uh, so I guess expect that if, if, if that's not, you know. And I see these things, and then sometimes they make me interested, or sometimes they make me mad. And then I spend like an hour thinking about that topic until I get bored, and then I move on to the next one. Um, I also am like, I've always wanted to create things. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm a writer and stuff, uh, which I'm sure I'll get into at some point uh, if this series goes on long enough. Uh, but basically, I decided, you know, I'm, I'm tired of feeling unproductive all the time. I want to make things. And you know what they say, you know, work to your strengths. So basically, uh, what I've decided to try is to do... Basically what I usually do, but record myself doing it and see if literally anybody cares. And I don't really care if anybody cares, honestly, because it will make me feel like I'm doing something productive. And I'm hoping that will lift my spirits a little bit. So uh, I guess without further ado, I mean, we're going to jump into this. Is, this is definitely going to be a politics episode. Um, Right. I mean, I know it's bad to open with politics, but like, you know, what? it's what I think about like a lot. So because I'm sad. So whatever. Um, so obviously the thing going on, you know, right this minute while I'm recording this is uh, the last of the UK election uh, results are coming in. Like show you my little display. Um, so the last of these are coming in. Uh, you know, I've been following this. I like to follow international elections in general. Um, I, I've been following a lot over the past couple years. Uh, just whenever they happen, um, I can get my, I can get the list. Um, uh, here, this nice Wikipedia list of all the elections happening in 2024 around the world. Uh, obviously, some of these are like dictatorships, so the elections are like doesn't matter. Um, others are democracies or are trying to become democracies. So I, I like to follow these. Um, and I keep an eye on all of these. I always have this tab open. But uh, yeah, so I've been watching these numbers roll in. Um, the possibility of, uh, oh, this number has gone up, which means that let's take a look at Warrington actually and see what happened there. I didn't, I didn't actually look at Warrington yet. So my, my exciting possibility uh, for this and reason why I'm still tracking it, even though most of the results have come in, I'm specifically looking to see if the conservatives become the second biggest party seat-wise. What are we looking for? Uh, or 10, yeah. Okay, so yeah, the Lib Dems did gain seats. Oh, okay. So this was a big... So let's take a look at Warrington, actually. Um, because I have been looking at the four remaining. Warring there's four remaining. Warrington was one of them, so there's now three remaining. Uh, and London, which I'm also very interested in seeing the results come out of. Um, they don't do live results like we do in the U.S. Uh, they do, like, collective. These are depressing, but let's go up and try to find Warring. Um, Warrington. I should mispronounce everything because I'm an American, and I don't think the English deserve to have me pronounce their uh, silly towns correctly. 
uh, both for their colonialism and for, you know, America, right? Um, okay, so this was... Warrington was... There's four seats left. Uh, on the question of whether or not the Lib Dems are going to beat the Conservatives, um, Warrington was an important one because this was their biggest pickup opportunity left out of the four remaining. Two of them, the Lib Dems, don't contest, and one of them, they are well far behind. So here was their biggest pickup, and uh, looks like it went, the numbers were correct um, for them to actually stay ahead. They actually did better than I thought. Um, no, they didn't do better than I thought. Never mind. Um, but the, the conservatives lost more than I thought. So the, I, I, so the lib, no, actually they did better than I thought. I look, I'm going back and forth, you know, this is good. Um, so the lib Dems did better here. Uh, as you can see, uh, they got plus four minus nine. So the thing is right. So the conservatives now only have one, uh, and they have 12. So this was plus 11 plus one. Um, basically, we're looking for the net difference between Lib Dem wins and conservative wins. This being plus 11 is huge because it increases uh, the Lib Dem's lead by quite a bit because that was their big win. That was their last big A place where they're going to be able to, to take a win. Now, let's take a look at Sal. I got to make sure I mispronounce this correctly. S Sailford. Um, we've got... North tiny side, uh, and there's one more somewhere. It's down uh, and Strood. Um, so in Salford, the Lib Dems do contest, but it's a massive labor majority already. This is the last election, so there's only so much the Conservatives can lose here. So like. Yeah, if they lose all three seats and all of them and two of them go to the Lib Dems, that's going to grow their lead. Otherwise, or no, uh, only 21 seats are available, right? So, yeah, so it's 49-8-1. So, like, how many of these seats are going to be lost, right? I don't know how many seats. There's 21 seats up. How many? What is the distribution of those? What is the chance Lib Dems pick seats off of labor as well, which is unlikely? Uh, but not entirely unlikely. I guess it is, since it is a d labor dominated one, um, the Lib Dems appeal. Uh, one of the things labor has been labor has actually been losing seats in. Uh, and I guess I can talk about this one now. Uh, labor has been losing a lot of seats, which is good news uh, in particularly places where they dominate, uh, usually to independents. Um, and that is because of the way labor has positioned themselves which is badly. Um, Labor is winning this not on the merits of like, so I guess for those not familiar with this election, um, the conservatives suck. Um, this is well known. Uh, and I should get context before I just start going into the numbers, right? Um, the conservatives suck ass and they... Uh, do a lot of bad things. Obviously, they endorsed uh, Leave uh, in the Brexit vote. Um, and they do a lot of other bad things. And they have had a death grip on power for decades, for like, oh, like a decade now. Um, and basically, everybody hates them, uh, which is fair. They suck. But... The question here, so obviously the conservatives were going to lose this election, but one of the things Labour has done since they uh, put Keir Starmer in the, in the driver's seat is basically Labour has decided that its pitch to voters is no longer going to be that it has a different platform than the conservatives, but instead that they're the competent version of the conservatives. And the Labour Party has moved sharply to the right under Starmer. So the Labour Party's pitch is essentially we are going to we are going to endorse we're essentially going to endorse the leave position, even though it's in a minority position in the UK. Um, and there's there's good polls. Uh, Brexit. Okay. 
right? Like, right to leave, it was the right decision to leave is only 34%. Wrong to leave is 55%, and don't know is 11%. Right? I mean, this is just one poll, right? But, or one potentially, yeah, this is just one poll. So, obviously, you know, a grain of salt, but this gives you an idea. Um, right? Like, these numbers aren't necessarily accurate if they held a vote today, but like, there's plenty of people who probably think it was wrong to leave, but they shouldn't go back because people having weird, contradictory positions is normal, apparently. Um, but my point is, is, this gives you an idea of, you know, where history stands. But Labor's pitch has essentially been, we're going to stay the course on Brexit. We are going to embrace more socially conservative policies. They've specifically uh, enjoined the conservatives on transphobia and embracing transphobia. Um, uh, they've also shared the conservative position on the Israel-Palestine situation, aligning themselves with the United States. Um, and this has basically meant that Labour's pitch is we're the conservatives, but we won't defund the NHS and we won't and uh we'll be more competent in our decision making than the conservatives have been because obviously the conservatives have been completely incompetent <laughs> i mean they've gone through like what four prime ministers in the past few years and they all made the country like demonstrably worse it's not even like my american opinion right like that's that's like just like there's just numbers that say that it's worse so labor has, by abandoning its own left flank, potentially cost it, particularly on the Israel-Gaza situation, um, by embracing the pro-genocide position, they definitely alienated themselves. And that's why I'm still interested in the London results, which are actually finally starting to come in, which is interesting. Um, apparently, these weren't, these weren't here before. Um, but the question is how much they lose in uh, London or how close it is in London to see how much of an effect that'll have. And this actually does have uh, probably pretty big uh, implications for the U.S. elections. Like, obviously, you can't say one to one because the collapse of the conservatives is not even close to comparable to anything in the Republican Party. Um, like, this is this is bad. Um this is really fucking bad. Um, and it's not going to happen to the Republicans because the Republicans, A, have been much more competent at digging their, uh, digging themselves in and insulating themselves from electoral backlash. Um, and two, the Democrats are also just, are, have their own unique flavor of incompetence. And there's also other political considerations in the US um, that the UK doesn't have. So like a lot of Labour's gains here are not because they went, they tilted to the center, but because instead the conservatives collapsed, right? So you can't really read that one-to-one. -one. It's so obvious that it was the conservative collapse that gave the, most of these seats that I don't think even the dumbest of America well, a lot of those like neo, like uh, radical centrist American political commentators that the White House listens to for some reason are actually dumb enough to one to one compare this. When in reality, the thing you should be looking at is the places where labor is safe. Because where the labor can pick up from conservatives is very different from where the Democrats can pick up from the Republicans. Because the conservatives are still a big tent conservative movement because there's no viable far right alternative. Like reform gets a lot of votes, but as you can see, they have won two total seats in the entire country. So reform is not exactly relevant to the discussion, right? The conservatives are more just a right-wing party. 
with far right elements, whereas the Republican Party is a far right party, is a far right right is like half and half far right and right wing. Um, labor is a lot less big tent because there's other options. So labor gets to fill a more centrist role by default because it's the other big party. And you see this a lot in other European in the other European states where people are generally happy to swap between the conservatives and the and the and the social democrats. You see this in uh, Germany is another good example of this, where people are pretty happy to jump between the two because they're the two major parties, so they don't differ on that much. But uh, the UK conservatives have definitely moved much further to the right than say the CDU in Germany. Um, but they're not quite as far right as the American far right uh, and the American Republican Party. Um, they're very far right, though. They're close. On some things, they're more extreme, like the, this, the, but uh, on others, but on most things, they're not. And frankly, I, I was going to list the Rwanda deportation bill, but let's be honest, that's totally something American Republicans would do on a much bigger scale, so... They don't, I, the conservatives are generally not as conservative as the Republicans. They're close, but because people see the conservatives and labor as at least somewhat similar, um, people are willing to jump ship pretty freely between the two. Something that's not the case in the U.S. Um, but the key that I'm interested in is a seeing how badly the conservatives collapse and uh the lib dems are generally seen as centrist but they're much more closely aligned with labor they are in some ways they're more progressive than labor they are much more socially liberal than labor is they're also on the right side of history on israel palestine they're also um much more um, they're much more uh, rejoin than labor is on the EU question, whereas labor is we're going to maintain Brexit. Conservatives are we're going to extend Brexit. Labor is we're going to maintain Brexit. And uh, the Lib Dems are rejoin. Um, so it sounds like the Lib Dems are more progressive than labor, but actually they have a lot more economic. They're more economically conservative, so they're more they're not as libertarian as like the free Democrats in Germany, if you're familiar with them, but they are um, more economically liberal than labor is, which is obviously a more traditional social democrat party economically and maintains that. That is the one thing they have maintained in their party platform, I believe. Um, but yeah, so that's what I've been really looking at. And you've seen it, they've, in fact, uh, you can see here, um, a lot of the uh, NOC, which is no, no control, basically, meaning that no one party has control. So these will often be controlled by coalitions. Labor has lost a couple to no overall control. And these are deep red uh, districts um, that they lost because of independent pickups. Uh, specifically pro-Palestine independent pickups. Uh, so they were hit from the left there. Uh, it's a decent election for the Greens. I wish, I wish this was like a real leftist party, but man, do Greens tend to shit the bed the second they're in control. Look at Germany, right? Like, they were so good. They were so cool, dude. And then they just, like, they couldn't do it when they were actually in power. They had the right words, but they weren't able to execute, unfortunately. And it's going to hurt them in the long term. And that's the thing about these opposition parties that are, like, good. It's, like, often they're, they say the right things, they believe in the right things, and then when they get in power, they just can't execute on them. Um, and so I wish these parties would uh, get their shit together a little better, but... Uh, I mean, I'm glad that at least the Greens... Uh, we're able to get some gains. Uh, that's a generally good thing. The other category is weird because a lot of places, because there's a lot of different types of independence here. This is a very weird category, right? Like reform is included in here. Um, reform lost a lot of seats. They now only have two seats. That is the only two seats they won 
Uh, they lost a lot of their seat, their few other seats that they had. Um, but also included here are like localist parties that are just like from a local town. A lot of those were hurt by um, the the bigger parties doing better. But then there's other places where those local parties is improved at the expense. There's also progressive independents who came in and, like I mentioned, and targeted labor um, over their uh, Israel-Palestine position. So this is a very mixed bag. Like, and, and like what those local independents are like is very different. Some of them are conservative. Some of them are, are generally more progressive than the conservatives, but are also NIMBYs. A lot of NIMBY groups uh, I, I noticed in here when I was scrolling through some of these. Um, NIMBY being, uh, for those who don't know, not in my backyard, uh, meaning they don't want new housing built near them, uh, especially affordable housing, because they want to preserve their property values. Uh, NIMBYs are a bad, actually. I hate to be that person. Um, but yeah, so again, it's been 34 minutes and I'm waiting for my hit. Yeah, Epping Forest, um, was another one. This is what I woke up to. Epping Forest was the big, the la one of the last big conservative. That's not what I wanted to do. Um, the, was the last big conservative win that they could get like this is the other one um but this is a lot closer between the greens and the conservatives they'll almost certainly lose their majority well, i think this is no control right yeah they don't have a majority so nobody has a majority here um but my guess is they'll they'll lose some seats here um but this is their other big gain over the lib dems right if they lose us a handful, but if they only lose a couple seats here and the Lib Dems don't really gain. You know, that could that could stink. Um looks like Labor lost a lot of people for some reason in here. I don't know what happened. Man, that's crazy. I just noticed that. Following the resignation of Cornell, why did they resign though? the independent left. What the fuck happened? So this one actually could be crazy. Stroud could be crazy. I don't know what this result is going to be now. I was, I, I just did, I didn't notice this discrepancy. Join at Cornell. What the fuck happened here? News? Over a parachuted in parliamentary hopeful. Oh, so she was a parachute leader. She was a carpetbagger. Oh, wow. By the Progressive Alliance for 10 years. So this is a very progressive area. Or at least a semi-progressive area. Because there's obviously a lot of conservatives here. In the rule, at largest in the, in the ruling co rainbow coalition.
So she became an independent. Or no, maybe she wasn't parachuted in. Or she, like, rebelled. I don't know. Oh, so, okay, so she was a local, and they barred her. So Doina was, Doina's good, actually. So she's an independent now. So basically, okay, I get it. So Doina was the leader of the Labor Party and a local. And so she should have been on the shortlist for the, parliament, for the parliamentary race, but, the la but Labor barred her. Um, from running in the parliamentary race and basically said, no, we're going to put our own candidate from outside the district in. And so the, all of the labor people basically either resigned from their posts or became independents. And now the Greens lead in Salford. Or not Salford, Stroud. Interesting. So then these guys, the Greens, the remainder of Labor, the Liberal Democrats, and the Independents. Oh no, not the Labor. So these are the Labor people who are still, who are anti... Uh, what's her name? Anti-Doina. This is the Anti-Doina Coalition. These guys, the Anti-Doina Coalition are the Conservatives and Labor. And uh, everybody else is the is a, is the green is the green left. So that'll be really interesting when that comes in. Um, I obviously I'm not gonna sit here the whole time and talk to you guys the whole time because I don't want to waste your time. I don't know how long I'm gonna keep going, but just when I run out of stuff to say, I guess. But yeah, see, Epping Forest, here it is. Um, this was a huge conservative stronghold, so this was where they, they were able to pick up a lot of seats. So Stroud is going to be really weird. I don't know how this is going to turn out. Um, but either way, like no matter what, this should be a good pickup for uh, conservatives. The question is how much, because uh, Warrington was really fucking good for, uh, for the Lib Dems. Uh, they picked up a lot here over over the conservative. The conservatives lost all of these seats and the Lib Dems picked up. So that's that means it's good. Um, I guess I should probably put this on my on my little chart. Um, I can show you my little I say a chart. It's it's a notepad document where I track uh, elections. Uh, and, and put them into whether authoritarianism won or democracy won. Uh, the U.S. was not an election. I also include major events. Um, the U.S., I've started this, this chart last year. Uh, this is a new one, obviously, for 2024. Oh, I, I'm circling the text. 2024. Um, we can put the United Kingdom. The question really is whether this is... <laughs> um is this is like a big victory or a small one i think it's just a local election so i won't call it a big victory obviously the big victory uh for pro-democracy parties uh this year turkey was good but senegal was huge that was a huge election um especially after the uh incumbent leader uh tried to uh, he wasn't even running, but he tried to stay in power uh, by just delaying the election. So uh, a progressive uh, pro-democracy uh, leader coming in was really good. Uh, North Macedonia has two stars because there's another round, but it's looking real big, unfortunately. Uh, it looks like North Macedonia's uh, EU project is going to be off for, uh, I'm sure I'll come back to this list a few more times uh, in other episodes. So uh, if you're interested in seeing any discussing things on this list, uh, you know, I'm sure it'll come back to it. But uh, yeah, North Macedonia's EU project is likely going to be on hold for another decade or so, if not 
two decades, if not maybe forever, with how uh, how uh, bad things are looking there. So no new news from our friends in the UK because they're slow as shit at counting. It's been days, dude. This is like a New York counting times, dude. But uh, yeah. So basically the numbers here are actually because of Warrington, there is a genuinely strong possibility that the Lib Dems end up with more seats than the Conservatives, which would be great. And I think it would be a, just a, a symbolic blow to the Conservative Party, which hopefully in the general election that's going to come later this year will evaporate to nothing in the because I think they're going to do better in local elections because local elections are a lot easier to do well in. Uh, we see this in the U.S. as well, um, because the local elections, the local leaders tend to have a much closer connection um, to their constituents. Uh, and if they don't, it's very exploitable by you know, opposing parties. But if they do, it's a lot harder to lose. So people feel like a little more loyal to their local representatives than they will to their national representatives who they may not know. Um, so the UK Parliament election is likely to be a lot more bruising. Um, I think it's also likely to be a lot better for Labour, the Lib Dems, and the Greens. Although it will also be because the independent parties, while the Lib Dems, first of all, do tend to do better in local elections, as do the Greens, um, it's possible that they pick up, they will like, the Lib Dems will certainly pick up a bunch of seats, the Greens will probably pick up a couple seats. Um, the other place where Labour stands to gain is, of course, in Scotland, because this election is just England and Wales, mostly just England, which is basically just the entirety of the UK, if you actually look at how they do their politics, but... We can pretend Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. Well, we can't even pretend Northern Ireland matters to the English. But, uh, and uh, I, I do f firmly support Irish reunification. If you're looking to get my political opinions on uh, UK issues. Um, but uh, Scotland, uh, the, the SNP, the pro independence SNP have basically had a massive schism and. Uh, will likely completely collapse. So Scottish independence is effectively dead for the next probably 30 years. And I say 30, 20, you know, and that's because a lot of these movements, they take a long time to turn around, right? And people tend to take a long time to forget. Like, even if the SNP manages to find a, new, a great new leader, it's going to be a long time before people show trust in them again and before they're able to actually heal the, the, the schism. And there isn't a great new leader in the wings because one of SMP's big differences from labor and one of the ways they differentiated themselves was by being openly socially progressive, something I mentioned the labor has kind of abandoned. Um, however, there is a con socially conservative faction in the SMP because it's ultimately their big thing is Scottish independence. So when they were dominating, a lot of those people who were voted in were conservatives who support independence. And a lot of those, and those are the people waiting in the wings to take over the party and who have been actively sabotaging the current leader from within, uh, Yusuf, who is from the progressive wing of the party, which is the majority of the party, but the minority conservative wing has basically, since the election, been sa actively sabotaging him. And he also just hasn't done a very good job of countering that or trying to figure out a solution, right? Like, it's not like I'm not absolving him of his faults, but, you know, it hasn't been easy. So the SMP is likely to collapse completely and be replaced by labor. I certainly don't see the Scots voting for conservatives, although maybe they'll gain a seat or two. Because again, there are conservatives in Scotland. Most of them just vote for the SNP. But a, lot, a few, some of them might swap. But yeah, I'm very interested in Stroud coming in. 
that seems like a really crazy election. Like this could go any way. I have no idea how this is going to turn out. Like this is fairly like, right? Like this is easy, right? North tiny side. I mean, yes, I know again, I'm pronouncing these incorrectly on purpose. I can pronounce North tiny side. Um, is like, there's only so many seats the conservatives can even lose here and the Lib Dems aren't running here. So this is going to be a place where they can run up a small, like if they, like how many seats can they even lose here? They only have six seats. Um, you know, and they only won seven in the last election. So it's not like there's a big drop. There's like a big room to drop here. Like, there's only so many like there's only so many places they could lose here before they just run up against massive before the labor just can't win. I expect there to be a lot. I expect that actually labor's probably gonna lose a lot of seats here, but to independents, not to the conservatives. So I don't think the conservatives will run up a huge victory here. Um but they could, and again, Stroud is their big chance. And Salford's obviously also pretty expectable, right? You know, 31 seats are up. Um, I don't know which 31. Or no, sorry, 21 seats are up, not 31. I'm, I'm blind. Um, 21 seats are up here, so... Yeah, I don't know which 21. So it's like it could go either way. It could go any different directions here, but it looks like the conservatives will probably like how many seats can they lose? Right. It's 49, eight, right? again, another place. These are two like how many seats can they actually lose and how many seats can the Lib Dems gain? And they can gain zero here and then they can gain a handful here. Stroud is really the one that's going to decide it like. Let's say they're probably going to gain a net of five here, and they're at a deficit of what? Um, 20. So it looks very much like right now, I would say, and again, there's also the potential that some of these are not fully called, which is where the numbers changed here for the Lib Dems. Um, which is part of it is that some of these might not be fully called where like enough seats have been called to declare the council. I think all of them are fully called, but there might be a couple seats here and there for conservatives to win. And obviously the big one is that we don't know London yet. And London is going to be very interesting. Um, because we're going to see... how well labor does to independence. Turnout is pretty bad. And see how much pro-Palestine uh, people can uh, send a warning to labor, get their shit together. Oh, Stroud came in, Stroud came in. That's it, that's the big one. Let's go look. I don't want to look at the numbers. I want to scroll right to Stroud. I want to see where this is. There we go. Okay. Big hype. Big hype, everybody. Let's go. Or Stroud. Okay. S. Stroud. Okay. Oh, wow. Okay. So this was a big net. This was not as bad as it could have been for the Lib Dems. They lost a seat, but the Conservatives lost 12. So this is a net minus five for the Lib Dems. Which, given that this is, like, was the biggest potential for conservatives to gain, only getting plus five here means that I would say it's like 80-90% that the Lib Dems are now the second biggest party in the local districts, which is crazy. The Greens winning outright here is really awesome. Uh, good for them. Labor is now the second biggest party. Uh, mostly at the expense of the conservatives. But the Greens 
Now, the problem here is that now the Greens, the Independents lost all of their seats. I assume a lot of them joined with the Greens. But I assume, I wonder if Labour will fracture here, right? Like the out, the people who support the old, the, uh, Doira, is that her name? Doina. The Doina supporters will maybe split off and join with the Greens to, to run the council. Um, that would have been crazy if the Greens won their first council here. Um, but that's a big win for the Greens. Because uh, a lot of this was at the expense of the Conservatives and not, like, on the merits of Labour. Uh, that's actually a crazy result. Um, so yeah, see, that closed the gap a little bit with the Lib Dems, but now we're down just two. Uh, North Tiny Side and Staleford. And uh, once those come in, that will be... I don't have London results, but uh, that will be huge. Only six councils are still controlled by the Conservatives, and they will not win either of these that are left. So that is six. They've only won six. Um, Labour is likely going to win both of these because these are Labour places. So they'll be at 51. The Dems will be at 12, and uh, no control is 38 which is really potentially good, right? Because the Labour Party, as much as they suck at, and, like, I'm glad that, and, like, as much as I have problems with Biden and the Democrats, uh, I'm glad they're so much better. Um, because, like I mentioned, Starmer has embraced this, like, has truly embraced the go right to win. Um, which is a strategy that only would, first of all, would only work there because of the total collapse of the Conservative Party um, and probably just made some Conservatives a little more happy to jump over onto the Labour boat. But they probably would have jumped anyway, even if Labour hadn't changed its course. Um, but the, the Democrats and Biden on policy... There's two big places where the Democrats um, have not have uh, have refused to to embrace their identity as a big tent party because the Democrats really are a big tent party, but they often don't look it because they're very good at negotiating on policy with each other. The, all the wings of the party. That's actually one of the surprising things about how uh, uh, that's my good. I'll give like the Democrats some credit on being generally um pretty good um they're generally pretty good at coming together on policy uh, and and uh, negotiating with each other so even the centrists and the leftists can get along on most policy stuff and they can they can find a compromise that's acceptable to both um but there obviously is two big exceptions to that. One being the Israel-Palestine issue, where the uh, the neoconservative strain of the party's foreign policy has demonstrably won out against the majority of American opinion and a good chunk of their party, and basically the majority of the Democrat voters are against the Democrats on this. But the majority of Democrat elected officials have stuck the course on uh, being extremely pro-Israel for no reason, um, despite every bit of evidence, you know, against Israel. Um, they are very stuck. And you know, I'll, I'll, I'll give at some point probably a more nuanced picture um, on Israel-Palestine, because I know I'm just kind of glossing over it here um, and just using it as like a wedge issue. Um, you know, I'm Jewish. Uh, I guess I should admit that early uh, on my position on that. Um, but uh, yeah, obviously Israel is the bad guy here. I mean, pretty hard for the, it's pretty obvious, right? Um, like, you know, terrorist attacks are bad and Hamas does suck ass, right? Like, 
they have been they're they've not just terror like people are we talk about how hamas has attacked the israelis like even beyond that is hamas has been fucking terrible to the palestinians for years too they're but it's it's very much like that gaza has been essentially a slum by active sabotage year decades of active sabotage by the israelis um and you know what happens in slums uh crime lords basically emerge and hamas is essentially the mob right they're the they're the the most powerful militant faction in the region so they're the ones who gained power and of course being the one and your your main claim to power being you have the military force to enforce that power generally does not lead to good governance um so yeah it's uh, it's not it's a bad situation and obviously israel has been using their military might to exact revenge which is bad uh collective punishment is a war crime um and you know whether or not they're com- you know they're legally committing genocide uh they certainly want to <laughs> their rhetoric says they want to commit genocide and i don't know if intent is enough uh they're certainly committing ethnic cleansing that is certainly an express goal but uh i'm sure i can get into that more another time but my point is basically that the Democrats have not have been on very much on the wrong side of this issue, and uh, they have been very committed to not negotiating on it, uh, which is generally very weird for Democrats on policy. And the other thing they have not really negotiated on is strategy. Uh, they have refused to embrace a more pugilistic strategy, instead sticking very closely to their to um, like. What's the term? Uh, Focus tested, very clean, curated kitchen table statements that most Americans will read as typical politicians speak, which is why nobody likes the Democrats, because they seem like slimy politicians, because that's how they talk. Um, So instead of being more genuine and more open, they've continued on that path. And it has been almost universally to their detriment. Also, just general bad political leadership by Democratic elites. Um, And this is just like a strategy thing again. Like, I mean, look at what happened in 2022. Democrats could have won 2022 if they had chosen to invest money and not sabotage their own incumbents and not sabotage uh, people because they didn't not sabotage close election districts by not giving them any money because Sean Patrick Maloney wanted to give himself extra money to, you know, cause he was the guy in charge of that. So he decided to neglect a bunch of swing districts and like the democratic party at large decided not to invest in Wisconsin, which they lost by like a few thousand votes. Just, they just didn't invest because he was too progressive and they didn't want to give a progressive money. Right. Like strategy stuff. The Democrats have, very much stuck to the center um and i don't even like saying that because it's not even really the center it's so-called it's popularism popularists these guys these dumbasses these dumbass like columnists political perspective and you've also seen them stick to that on uh on specifically israel palestine but on everything else I will give the Democrats credit for generally being a lot better at compromising between the wings of their party, whereas Labor strongly just was like, we're going to always embrace the conservative position on socio-political issues. And uh, yeah, I'm hoping it hurts them because that should send a good, maybe it will send a signal to Biden. I don't know if he can even hear at this point, but uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not super big on the, I'm not super on the, you know, Biden is senile train. I think he's lost a little bit of his edge for sure. I think that's undeniable, but I, I think that like people take it too far. I think he's mostly all there. I just think he's a stubborn old man who's losing his edge, um, which obviously I'm not a huge fan of to be the president, but I don't think he's like an idiot. Um, like he's, he's, I don't think he's senile or anything, which honestly makes me kind of hate him more because he knows what he's doing 
like he has the full capacity to understand what he's doing in uh by continuing to give Israel bombs to use on civilians, but he's choosing not to because he's blind and stub because he's kind of willfully blind and stubborn about the issue. But hopefully, you know, the more it's shown that this sort of thing will punish you electorally. Like, obviously, this isn't going to be a clear picture because you're going to have people who can argue, look, Labor won with their position, but like they didn't win. The conservatives die to death because they suck so hard. I'm gonna, I need water. I should have poured water before I started this. I'll be back in like two seconds. My bridge is like right next to my uh, desk. Look, a, a live break in a podcast format. Isn't this exciting? Uh, I'll give you the ASMR water pour. Isn't that satisfying? Oh, it's so fucking hot here, dude. My building only has uh, one pipe. So they only have it in either heat mode neutral mode or air conditioning mode and these fucking assholes have not moved us into air conditioning mode even though it's like fucking what is it out i apologize to my american viewers i have switched to celsius it's 17 degrees which isn't that bad but it's been hot for the past few days uh it's actually been better in here it's only 24 degrees in here but i i am a very hot person not physic not like attractiveness wise i'm super ugly but uh uh i'm a hot person temperature wise so i i need it to be a little cooler otherwise i start sweating and being very uncomfortable which is obviously a big help for this whole depression thing uh and so i hope you see this is like what i do like this is me sitting here and scrolling through this this is just how i spend my days um and then i get bored and i move on to the next topic or i'll go onto like my blue sky or my twitter and i'll see something and i'll start thinking about that but uh i generally want to try i think i think the way to do this is instead of doing like a Uh, like a three or four hour stream where I go through like 10 topics. I feel like it's probably easier four topics. Um, I think it's probably easier if I just stick to one topic for like uh, recording so that people can like listen. I, again, I don't know if anybody's going to even listen to this. I don't care super much. Like I, I would appreciate it, right? Because I'm trying to make something and I hope people would enjoy it, but even if people don't really listen, I think it's um, I think it's nice just to have. I can. Oh, okay. right. uh, I'll turn it back on if there's any news. Um, like I, uh, I just lost my train of thought. Um, but uh, I was thinking about I'm. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely lost the train of thought there. Uh, something like that I don't want people to have. I don't want to do the whole. Uh, 10 hour or, you know, whatever, four hour stream with four different topics, because I feel like, no, I don't care that people if people don't watch this, I mean, I, I would like people to watch because I like making stuff, but I don't, I'm making this so that I feel better about how I'm spending my time. Uh, not so that I can get lots of views. Um, I guess we can scroll through my news do that real quick and we'll see if I, I pick up another topic or decide to just end it um eh. ceasefire talks intensify i hope i hope we could get a ceasefire hamas is indicating they may agree to a deal 
Israel's so fucking dumb. Like, look at this. The, the, like, like ha, they're giving Hamas the choice of accept a ceasefire and we won't, and, or rather, don't accept a ceasefire and we're going to invade Rafa. Or do accept a ceasefire deal and we're still going to invade. Like, like at least at least put some ambiguity on it. You dumb. This is a terrible negotiation. Like the the negotiation here has been dumb as rocks. Like Hamas doesn't have particular incentive to do anything, right? Because they're bullies and like, and they they stand. To, the more people, the more Palestinians hate Israel, right? The more their lives have been ruined by the Israeli government. And military, and the poorer and more destitute they are, the more likely Hamas is to gain support. Why do you think Hezbollah is doing this, trying to get the same thing to happen? Hezbollah has been trying to take over Lebanon for years, and a really good way to do that is to get the Israeli military to come in and start bombing civilians, because then the Lebanese people will be like, "Hmm, maybe Hezbollah is the guys we should support," because Hezbollah is a political party but with a military wing. Um. Right, so they want to be the heroes. Um, yeah. More cakes. Um. Born kids. Immigrants. Um. Oh, we already know that. Um. I his his comments were not xenophobic. Japan is so fucking dumb. Japan Japan calling people xenophobic, being one of the most xenophobic countries on the planet. Uh, don't ask them about their Korean minority uh, is uh, is really rich. OK, I'm interested in this. Let's take a look at this. Um, Mexican Senate OK is a change geared in part to U.S. born kids. So what what is going on here? Oh, okay, I see. Any right, indication on whether it's going to go through? It doesn't look like that. Basically, what this is is that when the U.S. deports because you know any child born in the U.S., even if is is technically should be a U.S. citizen, but the U.S. deports a lot of those children. Um, so basically, a Mexican family gets deported, right? So, so you know, a Mexican family they have a kid, a young kid that they was that was born in the U.S. The family is illegally in the U.S. They get deported to Mexico because the U.S. is making a point of deporting families now because we're such a good country. Um, and now those kids can't get Mexican need to they they are legally entitled to Mexican citizenship, but they're not able to get it because of the regulations. So they're cleaning up those regulations to make sure that those kids can get the citizenship. Um, and they need to prove that they're right because it they can't get Mac they can't get uh, access to public education because they can't be they're they're not Mexican citizens. Um, so yeah. Uh, that's a good change. Good for Mexico. You believe Mexico is now going to be like a Mexico is looking like it's going to increasingly be a, a bastion of democracy compared to the U.S., uh, especially once AMLO's out of office. I think his, I'm hoping his successor is a little less of a populist, a little bit with a little bit of an authoritarian streak, because like there is a lot of good stuff. The Mexican left is pretty good, but AMLO in specific is very much a populist guy with a lot of weird authoritarian leanings. I'm hoping his successor is a little less like that and a little more 
wonky. Yeah, Quailar finally got fucking caught. Like, everybody's known this guy's super fucking corrupt for years, so it's unsurprising that this is happening to him. It does basically kill the idea of Democrats eventually, of the, Democrat, of the Republicans fucking themselves into losing their majority, um, which could happen, in the Dem but the Democrats are determined to not let the Republicans fuck up anymore. Um, instead, they were trying to protect the Republicans as best they can by... Um, they're trying to protect them by uh by protecting johnson um if johnson went down i guarantee you like a bunch of republicans would just leave and the democrats would have the majority but i don't know if it would be enough with quay gone. but he is definitely a horrible guy and has deserved to be prosecuted for many years um unfortunately that's probably then a free win for the republicans in the house but These are always so weird. These fact texts are always like bizarre. Like the choice of what to do and the way they say it sometimes is odd. The centrist bias is very weird. Instead of like a fact bias, you should be biased towards like the facts, right? Not like being politically neutral. It's always so weird to me. I know a lot of news people do it a lot too. Oh, North Tiny Side is in. Let's take a look. So this is the one where there is no Lib Dems. North Tiny Side. Conservatives gained a seat here, and independents lost a lot of seats here. So actually, this was the opposite of what I expected. But uh, that's actually some good news. That is a plus eight for conservatives. So that's actually a huge win for them and closes the gap quite a bit. Now, it's down to Salford, Southfjord. And in Southfjord, this is the last spot. So they need to gain, right? There's only 21 seats available, so uh it's not looking good. And they need to gain get our calculator out uh trying to put it all on the one monitor luckily this monitor is fucking huge they need to gain a net of eight seats which is not impossible so it just depends it says the last election they gained three seats here so Which is why they've guaranteed the full council will have one at least one liberal democrat, I guess. Because this person is obviously not up. But we'll see, right? So they would have to pick up a net of eight over the Lib Dems here, which is seems very hard because they have to pick up five seats for that to happen, to tie with the Lib Dems. So it very much looks like now we're in a position. Unless they severely overperform in Salford, um, Southfjord, they're going to, you know, I'm going back to correct myself to mispronounce it more, um, to make sure that uh, it looks like the second largest party, not necessarily by vote, but by seats, by local council seats, is the Liberal Democrats and not the Conservatives, which is extremely funny But yeah, good nets for just about everybody here. 
Still nothing on London, it looks like. I don't know why it says these. They don't appear up here. I don't know what's going on here. Hmm. It's very early. I woke up at like 7.30 a.m. and uh... I'm I'm still tired. I'm a, I need to wake up later. Like I need to get to sleep. Oh, that was correct. Yeah, they talked about all this was so dumb. Columbia had a web their official web page that was up commemorated the '98 student protest that they cracked down on by basically saying, "We know we've learned the we're in a far different place today." We're not going to ever make the same mistake of having the police storm the campus and arresting hundreds of people. Oh, wait, we're doing exactly the same thing. Oh, my God. So dumb, dude. Let's see what the, what the Germans are saying. Deutschwied is, a, is like a, the German. Uh, it's like the German BBC, basically. Um, it's a lot more apolitical than the BBC. The BBC is controlled by conservatives. Um, a lot like the Polish broadcasting services were controlled by PIS. Basically, the conservatives installed um, all all media in the Guardian included um, in in the UK is controlled by the conservatives. Very similar to the US, where it's controlled by the Republicans. Um, by almost every major media source, including social media, are run by Republicans. Um, it's similar in the UK with conservatives running all their media. Even though the BBC is a state uh, is a state run enterprise, uh, a lot of the people at the higher positions were appointed by conservatives to run it as a conservative propaganda outlet. So if you ever wondered why those at uh, the BBC seem so biased on certain things, that's that's why. Uh, uh, feed is a lot more impartial. I've seen. Uh, it's general. It's genuinely run just as a, a neutral, impartial uh, news network for the most part. Obviously, it's going to have a bit of a pro-German bias, but that's to be expected with a state-run enterprise. They won't because. The conservatives are actually unironically huffing a lot of copium. They think this is actually a big win. They're, they're actually trying to spin this as a win. Um, because Labour wasn't able to win in a specific conservative stronghold. Um, uh, what was it? Thai something. They won the mayorship there that they were really worried about. Tees Valley. This one. Uh, they were super worried. They won this. By the way, they, they're spinning this as a win, right? They won 53 to 41. In the last election, they won the Tees Valley with 70% of the vote, I believe. We can actually, let's look at the actual number. Um, we can look at the mayor's. He lost 19%. It was 70. 72 to 53. Sunak, the second this was declared as a victory, Sunak ran his ass to this district to declare, we win. And we, he said, like, we win. And now labor can't beat us. We won this election. We're stronger than ever. And like they unironically believe this because the British, the, if there's anything you learn about the English, is that they huff immense amounts of copium at all times. So they genuinely, they backed off leadership challenges to Sunak. And they said, you know, this guy did a good job. He kept us within the Tees Valley. The question, of course, is whether they can hold the West Midlands. They lost fucking uh, North Yorkshire. 
this is the apparently dire. I follow a couple British guys. I think I even follow a guy, a British guy from York. And uh, apparently Labour doesn't win in York. Like, this is like an equivalent to like a Democrat. This was this is similar to like um, when Doug Jones won in Alabama, where it's like, what the fuck? That should not happen. It's a new mayorship, but like labor does not win here. So labor winning here is this is also, uh, I believe, Rishi Su where Rishi Sunak's seat is. So uh, he might lose his election. <laughs> he might not be prime minister because he'll lose his reelection. But they're trying to spin this as a win because they held on in a conservative stronghold where, again, in 2021, they won with 72% of the vote. Okay. I, I don't know if that's to say, but that's, uh, that's, that's, that's bad. Um, I hate to break it to the conservatives. That's, uh, that's really bad. You you don't want that. That's not that's not a win. They're huffing the copium. That's that's certainly a fucking headline, dude. Okay, Yahoo. Uh, they they want him to review this is I, I you know what i'll give them credit for audacity i mean they're desperately trying to delay this as long as possible because this is the the most dangerous one i mean i was actually pretty worried about this trial because it seemed like the prosecution was being frivolous um because it seems like it's very like blurred lines like obviously what he did was unethical um you know hiding money and using hush money payments is super unethical but it didn't look like it violated the law but the more that the prosecution has gone on with the evidence that they have it is really damning it's really it's it's really bad um so yeah they really want to delay that one and they want to avoid jail time for the gag order they also kind of don't want to avoid jail time for the gag order because like Trump going to jail might spark a revolution. Um, but like, also, if it doesn't, that's really bad. Um, for them, it's, uh, it's, it's not great. It's not looking great over there. The good news for Trump, of course, is that he's going to get presidential immunity um, from federal charges. That will not affect this case, by the way, for those of you who don't know. Uh, he is going to get official presidential immunity from the Supreme Court. Um, but or at the very least, the Supreme Court is going to say, well, we're not sure if he has presidential immunity, but why not one of the lower courts associate reassess this and then send it back to us later. So basically giving him instead of de jure and de facto immunity, they'll give him just de facto immunity. So they won't say presidents have immunity, but he'll they'll give Trump specifically enough time to get to the election where he can then win and pardon himself, giving him de facto immunity to crimes. Because uh, the danger to the Supreme Court of giving presidential, like obviously the Supreme Court wants to do the Republican thing and support the Republican Party, but the danger is, of course, that Like, if they say, hey, uh, presidents are actually immune from committing all crimes while in office, uh, then Biden can just, like, order them to be executed. Like, obviously he wouldn't, but, like, that would just be okay, right? Because it's, it, it's illegal for him to break the law. I mean, he already is breaking the law by, uh, by providing weapons to a, a country with... Uh, 
the, the way they're getting around it is basically because the U.S. is refusing to do is burying all of its assessments of Israel's human rights abuses and saying and basically not doing an investigation. They can basically say that they're not like they're they're skirting the legal line by basically we can set as long as Israel is not we don't assess Israel to be committing human rights abuses. We can still send them weapons. So basically, we're not going to investigate. <laughs> Which is horrible. And it, it's it's it sure is a decision. You know. So we only have one left. Well, we have a couple. We still have London. We still have the London result. And then, of course, Salford. But uh, I don't know if we're going to get any new news soon. I need a hit, man. <laughs> okay. I am kind of like that, though. Like, unironically. I am very, like, addicted to this sort of stuff. Because it's the only thing that, like, I need to, like, this is, this is how my depression works. Is I need to, like, get news or drama or something. I get hooked on this sort of stuff. I'm just hoping getting it out of my system and putting it, like, posting it will help me also. Like, another thing I'm hoping from this is that if I just saying it and posting it into the world, I'll be a little less obsessive about it. So that maybe I can focus on like more positive things with my time. Um, and then maybe I'll also talk about that stuff. Uh, I'd love to talk about things that I'm like interested in or passionate about as well. Um, but like this is consuming me right now. Yeah, the Vietnam. Yeah, the big difference is that the Vietnam War protests were way more violent. Uh, there's a lot more uh, protester training today. Um, where basically protesters will get like a list of like things that they should and shouldn't do um, to try and increase uh, optics and be more disciplined. Like obviously you're gonna have assholes. Like that's the thing with any protest. The assholes just get the assholes are just they love this sort of stuff. Like they'll like two assholes can ruin can spoil the pot, right? Like assholes coming in and being like, oh, I want to join this to be an asshole. And they'll come in on either side or whatever of the protest just to be assholes. But the vast majority of protesters these days are much more disciplined. Like you hear all these horror stories, but that's just because it's like propaganda used from people who aren't there. But when you see from reports from like reporters who actually go on scene and like go and visit. Um, and like go like to the, the actual protest and talk to people. Generally, modern protesters are a lot more uh, disciplined because they have access to like the internet and like a lot of historical examples, so they can like have like lists of things to do and to not do. Uh, which helps. Uh, which obviously the because again, right? Like th that's not going to stop the media from reporting really badly on you. But it is going to stop them um, from, uh, but it is going to at least stop you pissing off your local community because your local community, the people who are actually there are going to know whether or not you're, ass you're acting like assholes. Um, and, and not even breaking the law really like regards being an asshole about it, right? Like it's fine to it, like obviously if you break the law there's going to be consequences but that's like those consequences are part of the protest right like that's how you drum up like you know by breaking the law and getting them to crack down on you with the police like that is a that is a persuasion tactic um but you can do it in different ways right like you can like when they broke into the hall they didn't leave feces everywhere right like, compare that to January 6th, right? Where, like, people were shitting on the floor, stealing stuff. They had guns. They were trying to kill people. 
Instead, they just barricaded themselves inside. And then uh, when they were protesting at Columbia, they barricaded, they broke in and barricaded themselves inside. And that's it. And demanded to be, to make them be removed, themselves be removed. And that's it. That's all they did, right? And the police cracked down hard. January 6th was the opposite, right? The police didn't crack down at all, but people were shitting on the floor. They were trying, they were trying to break through and find the representatives and senators to murder them. They were trying, they stole a lot of stuff. You know, they made a huge mess. And, you know, obviously they broke some stuff, but it's, you know, and it's, it's not like, I'm not super mad about them breaking stuff, right? The more you break, the more, you know, because I don't care, right? Like, if you're, they, they hurt, they attacked people, right? They, they, all those, those Capitol police officers who ended up in the hospital, right? Like, I don't really care if you break windows, like windows, windows can be replaced. Like, oh no, you cost the university $500 in, in repairs. Oh no, they'll never be able to afford it with their tens of millions of dollars. Like, I don't care about like a little bit of property damage, right? Like, yes, it's illegal. But like, I don't really care that much. I care about hurting people. I care about, you know, that like hurting people is really bad. And being an asshole and stealing, they didn't steal anything. They didn't shit on the floor like assholes. Again, I can't believe that they fucking did that at the fucking January 6th. They found fucking shit. Like somebody shat on the floor. Like, how childish do you have to be? How animal-like do you have to be? That you know, just gross. I think Khan has been better, right? Like, I think Khan might survive on the fact that he's generally oh, a more result is that Khan has been Sadiq Khan has been generally a more on the progressive wing of the Labour Party. I don't know. I think so. Take a look, I guess. Um, so I think that might save him. Yeah, he's in support of a second referendum. But again, see, he's not he's not very strong on this either. He's just center left. All right. So he's a, so he's more in the center of the party then. All right. I thought he was more on the progressive side, but I guess not. Um, doesn't really say position on uh, Israel Palestine. Oh, here. Okay, so he called for a ceasefire. Yeah, a lot of these Orthodox guys, this is probably an Orthodox dude, right? Yeah, Orthodox. As a Jew, I can tell you, the Orthodox people, they're the, they're the cons very conservative ones. Reform Jews uh, and more centrist Jews are, very are generally much more progressive. The Orthodox people are fucking weird. They ruin, they're a huge problem in Israel. Uh, they're, they're, just a, they're just a problem everywhere, yeah.
Yeah. These guys are, they're generally, they're ultra conservative. They're ultra, they're, they're not, they're not generally nice folk. Um, not all, obviously, but the Orthodox community tends to be a little weird. Uh, especially the conserv the very conservative Orthodox people are a little bit. I'm shaking my hand, which you can't see, obviously. I don't want to. If you think if you think nobody's watching now, <laughs> but uh, yeah, they uh, they tend to be. So he's he's on the right side of history on this generally. So I don't think he'll be hurt as bad, right? Because if he personally says that he doesn't want Israel to do the genociding, then that might save him from a loss, right? Compared to Starmer. If it was like a Starmer running, it was like, yeah, go get him. then he might lose because they would just all vote for the Greens or the Lib Dems or an independent. But again, it's not like this is like five labor seats or six labor seats. I don't know what this is. Anyway, I think we're going to be winding down. I think I'm running out of stuff to talk about. But I, I I don't know if people will enjoy this or if uh, if this is or if I'll keep doing this. Um, Syria has a large Muslim population. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think I'm, I'm about at the end of, uh, what I have stuff to say for, uh, but, uh, this was, I, I guess, nice. Um, also I'll try, I'll, I should try to do more of these whenever, whenever I'm getting sucked down a, a rabbit hole, I should just click the record and, and, and post, post one of these. And, uh, maybe, maybe you guys will like it. Maybe you guys won't. But uh, it's about just trying to be more productive, at least feel more productive and make things. Even if the things I'm making are just recording myself, do my usual obsessive, weird internet scrolling. Um, and it doesn't look like there's going to be any new updates. We'll give it to the 30 minutes. Give it one more minute. But... Uh, yeah, so uh, if you did watch this, I don't know if anybody watched this. Thanks for watching. And uh, I'm always bad at ending these, but uh, I guess I'll just say... Uh, I mean, we, know, we do have at least the confirmation, right? The Lib Dems. Unless some crazy shit happens in South Pyrd. The Lib Dems have beaten the Conservatives, which is... Enough to make me happy. Oh, well, this just happened, apparently. So he did win. So actually, there was news. Okay.
Yep. Yeah, again. The Liberal Democrats, should they embrace the more center-left uh, hole that Labour is leaving behind right now as Labour moves to the right? The Lib Dems could move a bit to the left and uh, kind of take a lot of Labour support because Labour is going to be super bloated after these next elections, after these elections. So this is a prime opportunity for the Liberal Democrats and the Greens to just make themselves distinguished. And honestly, given that they align on a lot, maybe even join together. But obviously, this is pragmatist rainstorm speaking, who likes to, to, to see where you can do the right thing by, in the most pragmatic means possible. Uh, I'm, a big pra I'm a big fan of pragmatism, um, political pragmatism. Uh, so like maybe if they joined together and had a bit more of a center lefty platform that cut labor and again I, I, I'm not a big fan of basing your political platform on the left right scale like if you're going to make a political platform make a political platform uh, based on politics you actually on policy positions that you actually believe in um, in and then get assigned the thing so what my point is if they take a bunch of positions that are good and that are supported by a lot of people, they can undercut labor, who is now going to be super bloated by a lot of conservative voters. Uh, and there's going to be a lot of lefty labor voters, center left and lefty labor voters, who are a little uncomfortable with that and might be open to jumping ship to the Lib Dems and the Greens and independents if they join together, especially if they join together. But the Lib Dems, I think, are a little too attached to their centrist position to, to do that, even though in some ways they are more progressive than Labour. There's another update. Should have had this open. Apparently there was a fucking mess in the West Midlands. Yeah, that's why we don't have a declared winner. What was the assessment of this? I, I have my windows open again. I mentioned the heat. So that's going to be loud. It's early in the morning, so not too much is happening. Andy Berm, isn't this? No, Andy Street. We don't know who's going to win that. There's going to be a recount, so apparently it's a mess. But yeah, they're losing all the mayorships except for the, the one in the Tees Valley, and we don't know who's going to win this, but they won every other one. That's pretty bad for the conservatives. I think these are like governors. Uh, I think uh, for the Americans, I think these are like similar to governors. Maybe, kind of. Like I don't, I don't claim to understand all the ins and outs of Brit politics. Yeah. 
Yeah, the pip in Castle Point is a NIMBY party mentioned. And not only do the Lib Dems now control more councils, they control literally more seats, which is pretty damning. Yeah, it's getting bad there. And this pier is not coming up fast enough. Yeah, the renewed pressure is good, at least. Um, again, we're winding down. Unless we get another hit. Come on, we're addicted. Let's go. Join me in my addiction. But, uh, yeah. No more new news, it looks like. So the West Midlands mayor race is probably going to take a while. Um... I'll probably, uh, I don't know if it'll be, I, I don't know if I'm going to record another one of these today. Uh, I might. Uh, yeah, you see this highlighted red. I have uh, uh, an app, a uh, thing called uh, Shinigami Eyes, which uh, marks pro, explicitly pro-trans and anti-trans groups. Uh, obviously, the Workers' Party are a, uh, a conservative leftist party, so... Uh, and uh, I saw them. I was like, "Oh, I might do a, a thing on uh, on on uh, political parties at some point because that's something I'm interested in and showing like the differences of all the political part of different types of political parties, um, and maybe also talking about third parties in the U.S. and why they don't exist and how they could exist in the future, even without major reforms." Um, so yeah, we're not going to find this answer. I assume a lot of these are going to take a while and a lot of these are going to be won by conservatives because people love to crack down on criminals instead of rehabilitate them because people are cruel and hate poor people. But all this left is, is our boy Salford. Uh, which, uh, will give us... I think it's almost impossible for conservatives to to take back the lead here. So, like that is settled. That question that I had at the beginning of this um, podcast is now officially settled. I think, like ninety percent, ninety five percent chance settled that the Lib Dems will be the second biggest party, which is very good. We can take a look at the maps. The Labor has big gains. Look at all the gains the conservatives made. They have like three, they have like seven dots. The Greens made big gains, but they still haven't uh, become the number one anywhere. Obviously, their big ones were uh, Strood and Hastings. Reform still only won two seats, two whole seats. Good job, far right. You guys totally don't suck. Yeah, and obviously here, you know, you can see the where the independents did well. Obviously, again, those independents are very quite wildly in their ideologies, so they don't really say too much of anything. Still, everything looks late coming up labor here in uh, in the city. Wonder if any independents. Yeah, we'll probably also do a video on Ukraine or something at some point. Um, get to learn my opinions on that. I'll slowly unravel my opinions over time. And I'm sure there's more of these. Uh, I wish I was doing this honestly uh, last year, because then I could have done one on Guatemala. 
Uh, I followed that one very closely because that was a crazy election. Uh, but yeah, it looks like no more coming, no, no more news coming in for now. But uh, maybe we'll check back in on this. Probably not. Uh, it looks basically settled. Um, most of my questions are basically settled. I am curious what their last results coming in are, but I don't think that's like worth continuing here. So again, I guess uh, thanks for why. I know we extended it a little longer, uh, but thanks for uh, watching if you did. Uh, and uh, if you potentially liked this, then um, I guess I hope you'll come back if I do this again. I hope I do this again. I hope this helps me, right? The, the primary purpose of this is to, to try to get me out of my funk a little bit. Lift my spirits. I gotta upload this because now the next challenge, because I recorded it, now I have to actually like go through the process of uploading it, which is like a whole thing for me. Uh, I also probably need to get like a fucking thumbnail or something. So, yeah, I gotta commit to doing that today so that I can actually get this out and have done something and made and uploaded something. But again, let's actually finish an episode. Let's wind it down. I have to learn how to finish things if I'm going to make this a series. Thank you for watching. Bye.